Um, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone, uh, to this, what is the um, first of a seminar series of a new uh, international research network called Back to the Future, uh, the 1980s. Um, the, the purpose is to sort of rethink the way we understand the 1980s, the place of the 1980s in, um, in global history. Um, I, hopefully... Well, I know uh, quite a few of the names of the people attending, so I know that, that quite a few of your members, and hopefully you'll uh, you'll be interested to join us. My name is Martin Smith. I'm um, I'm a historian of Japan, um, and particularly uh, the post uh, the post nineteen forty five period and uh, the sixties seventies uh, and more recently the eighties, uh, and I'm going to chair the session. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce the speaker in a sec. Um, I'll just say that we have a, a, a Q and A section at the bottom of the screen where you'll be able to type in any uh, questions that you've got. If you do want to speak, then you can just raise your hand, and I'll be able to. Um, I've I've never used Zoom before, but I've got this little thing that comes up with allowed to talk on the side of your name. So if you do want to speak. Which would be really nice. Um, then, 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 yeah. Just let me know when we do the Q and A. Um, I've introduced the speaker, who um, is um, the guy who started the, um, the the network or came up with the idea and put out the call for people to come along. Um, James Cooper. He's an assistant uh, associate professor at uh, York St John University uh, in the UK, in a snowy. It's certainly snowing in Sheffield. I'm in Sheffield down the road from from Jim and uh, yeah, in a snowy north of England uh, today. Um, he is um, a historian of, um, well, the US, I guess, American studies uh, and, and history. Um, and um, his first book um, was about the subject, I think that, that he's gonna talk about today, about Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan and their um, special relationship. And his second book, uh, was on um, uh, the role of U.S. presidents in uh, the Northern, Northern Ireland conflict. Um, so I'll let Jim talk. Jim's going to talk for about half an hour, and then we've got plenty of time for questions. Um, so as I say, if you come up with questions while um, Jim's talking, then please just type them in, uh, and then I can go through them. And if you want to speak um, when we get to the Q&A, then just put your hand up and, and, uh, or thumbs up or something and, and let me know. Uh, I'll hand over to you. James then and, and mute myself so that you can't hear me. Okay, so hopefully uh, my screen is now sharing. Is that, uh, is that working okay, Martin? Um, should be working. Yeah, okay. it's that, uh, yeah, yeah. Groovy, so, um, so yeah, thank you all for coming along today. So yeah, it's great to um, start, I suppose as my said, I kind of sent out an appeal for, I suppose, global international academic friends um, to talk about the 1980s with and um, for us all to share our research and um, seek new ways for collaboration and so on. And it was great to have so many people respond. And so we, our first activity is, of course, this seminar series that I'm, I'm, I'm first up and there'll be four more colleagues to follow. Um, of course, you know, being, I suppose, is my idea, so I, just, so I suppose if I had to follow my sword and kick it off ultimately. So, um, here we are. So I'll be talking say about Reagan and Thatcher. I've kind of been with them now for a while, probably since um, 2016. I think when I started my PhD, 20, yeah, um, so quite a long time. Uh, it was my first, my PhD, which became my first book, was looking at Reagan and Thatcher in terms of their domestic politics, domestic policies. Um, looking for maybe, maybe who influenced whom, what's a kind of transnational exchange of ideas uh, between Thatcherism and Reaganism and so on. Um, it's a kind of book which, frankly, I imagine a lot of people may be pleased that it exists, but they're probably even more pleased they didn't have to write it themselves. Um, it's so one, one of those classic, uh, classic books there. Um, the second book, obviously, is on, on Northern Ireland. And um, last year, um, I returned to Reagan Thatcher for another book. Um, so almost like an accidental treaty, uh, an accidental uh, um, trilogy on uh, Anglo-American relations. And it kind of like in good kind of like a trilogy fashion, and the third book kind of returns to the um, the themes or the ideas of the first book. Um, so, but uh, yeah, so let's kick off then. Uh, so where, in terms of network, then when I was thinking about this talk, I thought that, so we think about what the kind of themes which we were knocking around in our very first uh, meeting about what type of ideas and themes and issues which we could explore in our network to make as broad as possible. And so I just shamelessly kind of cut and paste the list from our latest HNET um, 
and call for members. And um, in our network of seed, the ATIS does bring about a real rich and diverse um, um, areas for exploration, um, topics to discuss and so on. Um, so I thought, well, you know, how can I draw on this? Well, our sport of choice really comes to Reagan and Thatcher. I thought maybe I could talk about art and fashion. Um, I was looking for some um, good pictures on Google image of high, high, high shoulder pads and maybe some shower suits um, for our people in the UK. They may, rem they may remember that. Um, Bowles was settled upon this image here, um, the famous Gone with the Wind um, poster um, for Reagan and Thatcher. This, in, this image is in the Socialist uh, Workers newspaper in 1981 in Britain. And it very much marks the, the entrance of Ronald Reagan to the world stage. So he was elected president in 1980, he becomes president sworn in in January 1981. And he very much plays up the left's view of Reagan and Thatcher. They're in, they're in cahoots. Um, it's also very kind of nostalgic, but a throwback to the Gone with the Wind, that kind of classic um, Hollywood movie. Um, it's very problematic, of course, these days. But you see you have the um, and Rhett Butler, Scarlett O'Hara, with Thatcher and Reagan in some real kind of passionate um, romance. Um, I love the tagline about the film to end all films, the most explosive love story ever, and how she promised to follow him to the end, the end of the earth, and he promised to organise it. And what I love most part about this is, the, is, a, is a story about it where Reagan apparently was showing his friend of his around his ranch in California and then went into the basement and uh, this poster was there in the basement and his friend said you know you know um, Dutch you know his nickname is Dutch and why don't you have this upstairs in the the main house and he said I'm, I'm, I'm worried that she'll see it and he blushed and the she um, wasn't Nancy who he was talking about but I think this very much shows the the view of Reagan Thatcher at the time. Another theme which I could, you know, could talk about, or certainly a very, very rich and important um, um, area to research Reagan Thatcher these days, is of course the relationship with the LGBTQ plus community. Um, here, you know, very obviously some very negative, very sad, um, you could say horrific um, stories here. Obviously, you have the the AIDS um, scandal, the AIDS pandemic, the AIDS, the AIDS scandal in the 1980s, where and the Reagan administration just didn't act. Reagan publicly didn't mention the word AIDS. And so I think it was 1987. Um, if you look on the final relations of the United States, there are documents where in 81, 82, 83, the State Department are actually kind of briefing people um, who work for the State Department and constants around the world about AIDS and HIV, trying to you know, come up with, you know, what, what basically trying to what's going on, this is what we think causes it, this is where we, where we think it all comes from. But nothing was being done. Um, really on a, a national um, stage and certainly from the there was a complete lack of White House leadership on that and of course um, in 1987 there's a, ca a campaign in which um, a poster used by the Conservative Party and this kind of culture's attitude you could say feeds into the very controversial I think it was section 28 um, of the local government legislation which prohibited um, I think it was like 89, 90, 91 around then the, the discussion of um, all the, all what they call the promotion of um, homosexuality um, in schools. Um, so, and that was repealed um, uh, probably about maybe 10, 15 years ago, I think in the UK. Also you could look at Reagan Thatcher from a music perspective. Um, I use these sources with my students um, on our Reagan module last semester, and they really enjoyed it. They got a lot of it. If, if anyone's with us today, I hope they would agree with that. I think it's a great way to, Look at the protest songs and um, artists and what they're saying about um, the conditions of the time. Um, so these obviously the lyrics, these are uh, songs speak for themselves, but they're also they're good tunes as well. Um, another way you can look at Reagan's Thatcher is of course the story of race and immigration. You have there two images of Reagan there signing into law, um, you know, Martin Luther King Day, and um, Reagan also signing into law immigration reform in the mid 1980s, um, which is sort of big peak a big spike in amnesty. Um, it's the kind of thing which you couldn't imagine perhaps a, a Republican president um, doing today. But also, um, despite those, what you can say, kind of positive um, advancements in terms of uh, for Reagan's record on um, questions of race, and immigration and so on, you also had a pro problematic um, history of it as well. Um, so talking about like, the welfare queen, especially in the 1970s, um, that very infamous um, so you can kind of race baiting and dog whistle, to put it, put it crudely, um, remarks. And of course, you have um, Margaret Thatcher, who, even though she was one of the architects of the European single market, 
which of course promotes the free movement of people um, across member states of the modern of what we have now says the European Union. Um, she also um, used um, language um, um, which we frankly wouldn't um, expect or like to see perhaps um, today um, when it comes to questions of race and immigration in the UK. So the, but moving on to the, the main topics of the talk, in terms of the historiography of Reagan and Thatcher, it has kind of gone through almost like a standard evolution of development, you could say, in scholarship. So it started off, as you would expect, with the work of journalists, really, um, perhaps, perhaps conservative journalists, um, they kind of writing, um, sort of maybe cynically, perhaps writing to make some money, interesting topic, but they're not kind of using um, often new historical sources or primary sources or historical methodology, which we would use more for really kind of joint biographies. So you get um, Nicholas Wapshaw's um, biography, the best of the light is Reagan Thatcher by Jeffrey Smith, who actually did lots of interviews, especially Margaret Thatcher, um, to support um, what he was doing. You've got John O'Sullivan, who then brings um, Pope John Paul II into the story. But then you get the wave of um, of scholarship or academics turning their attentions as the as primary material becomes available. There's some great work there. Archie Brown, of course, who wrote the Gorbachev Factor, emphasised the importance of Gorbachev in the ending of the, ending of the, ending of the Cold War, um, turns his attention to Reagan, Thatcher and Gorbachev too. Um, Richard Aldous's book um, is really, it's probably, probably the best book on Reagan, Thatcher's foreign policy, really highlighting the tensions, difficulties, um, in their relationship. And of course, I've contributed in a small way to, to, to this field as well. Um, but as you can see as well, tensions are turning now to um, more specific themes of the relationship in terms of, for example, Sally and Trahan's work on Reagan, Thatcher and Latin America. But Reagan, Thatcher are often taken to be um, the two peas in a pod, you know, in cahoots together. Um, people represent the same kind of emergence of um, the new right, um, resurgent neoliberalism, um, free markets, capitalism, and so and so on in the 1980s, which of course in the, one of the hallmarks of the 1980s is that resurgence of free markets, tax cuts, small government. It's kind of pushed back against um, the Keynesian um, economic settlement since the Second World War. So both of them as well, they're both kind of, they're, they're, they present themselves as outsiders. So Reagan likes to present, present himself as the actor, so the citizen politician, although really given he was in Hollywood and he was the basically led the Screen Actors um, Guild, so you know, in charge of the Oscars and so on. Um, and in fact, he was governor of California for two terms and a conservative darling. It's probably about as establishment as you can get, really, um, in terms of uh, his political career. Um, and likewise, Thatcher tried to present himself herself as the grocer's daughter, um, you know, the, uh, the woman in the man's world, to put it crudely, um, the ultimate outsider. Um, but really, in many ways, she's still kind of a classic conservative um, member of parliament. Um, she was also you know, a he fight, basically, in a Lord he fight, really, in the uh, 1970s, for example. But they're both associated with this um, pushback on um, the post war settlement. So, the increasing, in, in, in the British case, kind of privatisation, so denationalisation of state industries, so gas, um, other utilities, and the railways. Um, British Telecom was the first, of course, um, pushing back against trade unions. This um, increase in the of individualism, and in Reagan's case as well, you know, again, tax cuts, um, taking on trade unions, which he, of course, he did in the air traffic controllers in 1981. And they're both very much about the Cold War. Um, they're both Cold Warriors are talking tough on communism, and they both have this mission to reverse what they think is a national decline and to restore national prestige in their respective countries. So today's main themes then for our talk, Really kind of touches on international relations, neoliberalism, and politics and policy making. So, in terms of international relations, Reagan and Thatcher are seen to be examples of the Anglo American special relationship. So, we're talking, you know, in the, the pantheon of uh, Winston Churchill and FDR, JFK and Macmillan, and of course, after Reagan and Thatcher, you get Blair and Bush, um, for example. So, seeing that kind of example is close relationship. Of course, there's lots of work done on Anglo American relations in terms of. Is it special? Who's it special for? Uh, what makes it special? Is it more of a functional relationship? Um, is it more depending on the personality of the leaders or shared interests and so on? So I think maybe we might touch on those things a bit today. Um, obviously, in terms of raiders and factories, we talk about the new right, and that very much speaks to neoliberalism. Now, neoliberalism, neoliberalism is a slippery concept. People talk about it quite a lot. 
but ultimately there's there is some debate about is it a buzzword what exactly does it mean um david harvey the eminent um, scholar he's you know I think he's probably got probably the best working definition we can do really was um it's all about basically promoting entrepreneurial freedoms um private property rights free market and free trade um but i think what we'll see is that reaganism or reaganomics is different to naturalism and that that in turn feeds into um politics and policy making where actually i think what we'll talk about today is how actually ultimate reagan and Thatcher are two politicians and they've got their own national interests they want to put them first um, so in some ways, it's probably a bit of a reach, but you could argue that there's no real difference between domestic politics and foreign policy. It's all politics. You're serving your national interest or your own um, electoral interest um, one way or the other. So kicks off just a, this will be, I suppose, a whistle stop tour of the Reagan Thatcher relationship, trying to pick out some of these themes. So in the, the first couple of years of their relationship, it's a bit of a mixed beginning. Um, Thatcher goes to Reagan. Um, in February 1981, she is the first major world leader to do so. She's technically the second, the leader of South Korea goes there first, but she's the first major world leader. There's a big thing about how actually you've got Reaganism, Thatcherism, um, are they the same? And what does Thatcherism mean for the future of the United States? So, for example, in the New York Times, they talk about how there's a real fear that Reaganomics will lead to Thatcheritis. Because Thatcher, of course, she's coming in 1979 and 81, you almost get the high point of the Thatcher recession um, when you, you get three, four million people unemployed. And there's a real fear that maybe actually Reagan, because he's talking like Thatcher, would be acts like Thatcher, all the American economy um, end up in a bad way as well. So, what you have at this meeting is Reagan and Thatcher is praising each other and almost using each other for political cover, but saying to talk about how they believe the same things. But behind the scenes, the Reagan people are briefing the, the press. That actually, no, Reaganism is not Thatcherism. They're very different things. And Donald T. Reagan, who's the Treasury Secretary, can go, he's going to Congress at the same time as Reagan Thatcher, probably some, eating jelly beans in the Oval Office. He's briefing Congress um, that actually, no, our plan is different to what Mr. Thatcher has been doing in the UK. But despite this, you know, this mixed um, uh, visit um, in, in DC, when they go to the G7, Thatcher kind of st sticks up for Reagan a bit in his first of the G7 in Toronto. Um, and he comes over and he says, oh, thank you, Margaret, for support. He's all I know, boys will be boys. And she kind of like dismisses all the, the bad behaviour that way. But also, but as 81, 82 develops, you can see a real divergence between not just Reagan and Thatcher, but between Reagan and um, Western European allies, where after you get the uh, martial law declared in Poland in response to the Solidarity Movement, um, the Reagan administration issues various economic sanctions um, against the Soviet Union, which very much affects the, the, the interests of the Western Europeans um, because these sanctions are not just wanting to stop uh, military technology um, being shared in service, but kind of any kind of technology being used. And there's the, um, the gas pipe which they're trying to construct between from the Soviet Union um, through Poland all the way into um, West Germany. And um, the Brits and um, other countries have got interest in this in terms of the uh, contracts to do the work. And uh, the British company involved, John Brown Engineering, is very much reliant on parts from American um, manufacturers, and they can't access those parts, that technology. So Thatcher's very upset about this because it could mean very bad things for the future of some British industries, for example. You also have an image of Reagan doing his Westminster speech, 19th, June, 19th, June 82, very famous speech. This is where he says that the West will consign the uh, Marxist-Leninism to the ash heap of history. He declares that the Cold War will be won. Um, the, in the battle of ideas and liberal democracy all in the day. But in the background to this, of course, is actually the Falklands War. And uh, when, um, of course, the Argentinian junta, they take the Falklands, um, the British react and they send the Navy. Lots of Brits are frankly surprised we still have a big Navy, but there you go. And the Americans are trying to play peace. They're not really sure about this because ultimately they want the Argentinians the junta to stay in power because they're right wing and therefore they're good guys as far as the Reagan administration is concerned because they're not communists. And as a sense, if actually this Falklands War goes badly for Argentina, if they're embarrassed and humiliated, the Peronists, the leftists, will take over again. So it's real tension really between Reagan and Thatcher administration about what to do about the Falklands. And even when the, um, the, the Brits win the war, Reagan's the Reagan seem very keen that they don't humiliate Argentina. You know, they actually have to have a a just peace, so to speak. 
Uh, actually, getting 23 and 84, um, you get into the time of, uh, of re election. Um, the Conservative Party are re elected in 83 with a, a landslide, a much bigger margin um, than they had been in 1979. Um, and Thatcher, the, the traditional kind of view is that ultimately Thatcher wins because she won the, Fal the Falklands War, although there is some argument actually the economy was picking up um, at this time. You could also say that this election result. Um, shows actually how Thatcher's it's one of her biggest achievements in terms of the political debate in this country was that it's interest rates and inflation that matter, not unemployment. So in 82, 83, you still got very high levels of unemployment, but ultimately inflation and interest rates are beginning to come down. And so ultimately people re-elected Thatcher um, on, the, on that basis. Um, where previously, before Margaret Thatcher, if you have like a million people unemployed, politically you're in serious trouble. But the message of the Conservative campaign in 83 about, you know, it's, it's been four years, we can't go back to the latest, into the winter of discontent in our associations under Labour, there's still more to do, uh, maybe we'll wreck what we will go back to the past, we need to look to the future, stay on the right track, stay the course, if you will. That's replicated by the Republicans in 1984 to really let Ronald Reagan. And there's a very conscious um, effort to do just that. Um, you've got Republicans on the ground, watching the campaign, studying the campaign, looking at the themes, and the Reagan message in 84 replicates a lot of what the Republicans were doing. So um, here's just an example. There's a report um, from the, for the RNC from the UK general election that needs to stay the course. We need to basically show there's no kind of short term um, solutions. Got to look to the future, own the future and look to look to long term. And this is where you get to the morning in America um, campaign. That's a big controversy. At the end of 83 is, of course, the American uh, intervention in Grenada. Uh, Grenada, of course, a member of the British Commonwealth, and uh, Thatcher wasn't, wasn't told that it was happening. Uh, basically, there'd been a coup where um, essentially the Marxist um, prime minister had been killed. Basically, they'd be taken out um, by an even more left-wing um, um, group led by his old deputy prime minister. And uh, this is a very, very um, difficult moment for the Reagan-Thatcher relations where because she doesn't know it's happening, um, she's embarrassed. She's publicly humiliated by all of this. Um, Neil Kinnock, the leader of the Labour Party, but he's, in, he's saying what happened to your special. He's criticising her, um, mocking her um, in the House of Commons, for example. So in fact, she's very embarrassed about this. At one point, she's on the phone to Reagan, saying, please do not invade. And he says, oh, he, he kind of dismisses her. And uh, he writes his diary, he has not passed her, it was already underway. Um, but what he does, he actually calls to apologise famously. Can, there's an audio you can listen to online via the Thatcher Foundation website, as well as the transcript. Um, and it's Reagan very much playing on the idea that he's a, he's a naughty cowboy. Um, that I'd throw my hat in the door before I came in, I should announce himself. So, um, so hopefully the hat gets uh, the telling off rather than him himself. Um, Reagan's very apologetic to Thatcher. Thatcher ultimately, you know, she's very un un thatcher like where she kind of speaks very quiet for a lot of the time. Um, but she's kind of, in, you could say, grace of also, also what option does she have? It, so, I mean, when it comes to the Falklands War, as soon as the Royal Navy is dispatched to Argentina, the Americans can either stop the Navy or look and support the Brits in the war. Um, just like in terms of Grenada, she has no option ultimately. Um, it's a fait accompli, but it's happened. Um, but what the Americans do is they regularly then dispatch um, people to brief that just to make her sure she feels she's in the loop. So uh, Kenneth Damp, who's an undersecretary or a deputy secretary of state, um, he um, goes to see Thatcher shortly after this, this Grenada instance. And uh, in the documents, there's like a two or three pages, she's just telling him off um, about the whole, the whole, the whole issue. Um, in terms of re-election, economics come into play, domestic politics very much come into play. So in June of 84, you've got the London G7 summit, which Thatcher's hosting. You also Reagan going on a European tour. He goes to Ireland, um, like a lot of presidents do. Um, he also then goes to um, Normandy um, to do a big speech about D-Day, because it's a big D-Day celebrations, you know, the commemorations and so on, like that's 40 years previously. So Reagan's getting lots of free ad time or air time, we could say, as it's incumbent representing the United States, speaking about America on the world stage, speaking to um, the greatest generation um, you know, back, back home in America. But at this summit, what Thatcher does, she makes sure that despite her own frustrations with some aspects of Reaganomics, he comes out of that summit looking fine. Um, so there's been a lot of concern in the early 80s 
um, the first two or three years of his administration that Reagan's tax cuts and the public spending, for example, had increased the deficit um, completely out of proportion. If, you know, basically, if this was a bad thing, so the Western Europeans are very unhappy, especially Thatcher, because the US budgetary deficit was keeping interest rates high, and that in turn impacted on um, interest rates over across the Atlantic. But Thatcher makes sure that Reagan comes out of this summit without any public big criticisms of his policies. If anything, actually, it looks like everyone's very happy in endorsing um, what's happening in the United States and there are no concerns about it. So he does what you could call him a solid, a real favour um, politically. And the Americans write to, um, the Americans are very happy about this and the, the UK embassy in Washington are reporting that, that they're very grateful um, for the boost it gives the Reagan campaign um, in terms of the, the G7 summit and his broader European tour. But you see then in December 84, so about almost two months after Reagan's been re-elected, Thatcher goes and sees Ronald Reagan. It's in this meeting where she talks to him for the first time at length about SDI, where she has private reservations, but ultimately she thinks, well, if we can get British scientists involved, that'll be a good thing. Um, but, the, but this is one of my favourite quotes about Margaret Thatcher, because I think it very much sums up how she approached the relationship with Reagan, where she criticises everyone. No one's off the table. She attacks everybody, um, you know, European allies and the Labour Party. But then at the end, she basically goes, your, de your, your deficits are too high. Interest rates are too high. Then she gets the criticism of, of Ronald Reagan. And also when she's, but she, when she's doing this, she's not looking at Reagan, she's looking at Donald T. Reagan, too, then the, uh, the outgoing Treasury Secretary. So even though she's done this big favour politically for Reagan, she just goes back onto the pressure about um, about the US deficit. Likewise, this um, pattern of public support and private criticism continues. So in 85, 86, you see, you can see the emergence of Mikhail Gorbachev. Reagan Fash talk a lot. She, she praises Gorbachev, so Amanda can do business with. Reagan agrees. So um, the start, you know, reached out to Gorbachev, both of them, and, and meeting with him. Uh, when you get to the Iran Contra affair, uh, which is, you know, it's, frankly, it's probably a worse scandal than Watergate. Um, this really is a big, big problem for the Reagan administration and his legacy. And I'd suggest that actually, if it hadn't been for the emergence of Mikhail Gorbachev, the Iran Contra affair would have probably led to the Reagan presidency kind of like just petering out. Um, ultimately, Gorbachev's emergence gave him um, someone to do business with, which kind of therefore gave him um, that legacy for people to debate over whether was he was he the guy who wins the Cold War. But, just, but in terms of Iran Contra, when Thatcher's visiting Reagan, at the height of the criticism towards um, the Reagan administration. Um, she's interviewed on American TV and she chastises the American interviewers, saying, you know, How dare you speak about your president? Like you should be lucky to have Ronald Reagan, um, that kind of thing. And so when she gets back home in the, in the UK, um, she has a phone call from um, the White House and the cabinet and the Reagan team all, all gathered around and they all give her a standing ovation, apparently, um, over the phone. Uh, nowadays, of course, you'll do that on Zoom, but it's over the phone, she gets a standing ovation. Um, from the Reagan people. In terms of, I've, I've highlighted Reagan there because that's a real point of um, contention, um, which highlights a real difference um, between Reagan and Thatcher's worldview in terms of the Cold War. Um, Thatcher, of course, is a child of the Second World War. Um, she grows up um, during the Second World War, um, and her concerns about this um, is also seen again when in her opposition to the unification of Germany um, in 89 to, to 91. And, what you see at Reykjavik is essentially, it's a, it's, you could say it's a bit of a meeting that gets out of hand, um, where it's meant to be the meeting about the summit to come in Washington. But instead, if they start Reagan and Gorbachev, they start talking more detail. They almost do a deal where essentially they agree to eliminate all nuclear weapons. Now, Reagan, even though he builds up nukes and arms and so on, he doesn't like nuclear weapons. He wants to get rid of them. So for him, it very much is peace for his strength. He wants to build up the arms to get rid of them all. Uh, a bit like Kennedy, you could say, in that sense. But so Reagan offers to get rid of all the nuclear weapons. And um, Gorbachev says, no, I want, I want STI. You have to share STI, the strategic um, defense initiative in Star Wars with me. That, that missile, um, the laser shield to stop missiles in space. And of course, it doesn't exist yet. It's all, uh, you know, just all theory. And um, Reagan kind of refuses to do this. So Gorbachev refused to do the deal on, on the news. And when they leave um, the meet the summit, well, it turns to be a summit rather than a, a big meeting, um, Reagan, the Gorbachev says to Reagan, said, Rana, I'm not sure what else we could have done. And he just said, well, you could have said yes. 
Um, anyway, but when since Thatcher hears about the fact that Reagan almost agreed to eliminate all nuclear weapons, she is furious. Um, she's marching right around Whitehall, saying, how could this man do this? He does not realize you can't listen to any technology. Um, it's basically you're not taking my nukes, Ron. You can get the euros, you're not taking ours. And Western European allies are sympathetic towards this because also the Soviets do have um, conventional weapon um, superiority. So if you get rid of the nukes, um, there's a real sense of the potential the Red Army could just take all of Europe. Um, so if that you see in, the, in, the, in this uh, the record, the American record of the conversation on the phone, she's saying, well, you know, they're, they're truth gorbs, truth gorbs, trying to divide the West. Um, and also just said, so this is the type of thing that Neil Kinnock would do, like get rid of you naturally all your, your nuclear arms. Um, so there's a real disagreement there. She even goes over um, to Camp David to meet with Reagan to talk more about what happens at Reykjavik. Um, and they, were, they, and it's, they really want to get down to business, but um, in the back and forth about among all the, the aides and civil servants trying to set up the, the, the agenda for the, the meeting at Camp David, um, the Americans are getting very frustrated because um, the Brits don't want to have a cocktail party. They actually want to go straight to business talk about Reykjavik. And the Americans are saying, well, we are the hosts. We want to have cocktails. Um, so what you see then is that you get to the end of their time, shared time in power. Reagan and Thatcher, um, they meet for the final time as president and prime minister, respectively, in November 1988 in Washington, D.C. And it's, it's a bookend, really, to um, their first meeting um, at the White House, 1981, where, again, they, they, they both refer back in their speech and out of the White House to um, the, the situation they find themselves in in their respective country and the world generally, how bad it was, they said, and now things are a lot better in terms of um, the Cold War, in terms of um, economics and so on, and growth in the economy, and basically, as far as they're concerned, they've both restored um, national prestige, reverse decline, and they're praising each other's courage and you know, support in, in this shared mission. Um, of course, so when we think about, though, Reagan Thatcher, it, 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 it is a special relationship, but really it's a political relationship. Um, they're not really outsiders, you know, they are, they are insiders. And as soon as, of course, you become the, the head of your government, and, and also Reagan's case, the head of state as well, you can't really out, sorry, you are the insider. You are the ultimate insider. But also what you can see in their dealings um, throughout each other, um, throughout, throughout the decade, is that they, they do prioritise ultimately their own interests, what is good for them. Now, there are times where Reagan does generally help Thatcher. Um, so, for example, um, there's a big controversial um, legal case about British Airways, um, which is there, there is a collusion um, and to bring down um, Freddie Laker um, Airways, I think he is, in the United States. And basically Reagan kind of makes it go away, which shouldn't really have done. I think like the Justice Department or Senators' rights are they're furious about what has happened. But ultimately, he, he makes it go away because that you can't privatise British Airways, this legal case hanging over it. Um, they disagree about the American deficit, for example. They disagreed over Grenada. They disagreed over nuclear weapons. Um, but also, they do have this shared broad philosophy that smaller government is better, lower taxes are better, lower spending is better. Of course, the policies implemented are different. And that can be explained through institutional um, um, circumstances. So, for example, Britain simply cannot run up the kind of deficits that the Americans can because, you know, the world cares more about dollars um, than, than pounds sterling. Um, but also, of course, in Britain, if you're the prime minister and you have a majority in the House of Commons, you can do pretty much whatever you like, really. So Thatcher was able to control taxation and spending, where Reagan, of course, also was dealing with a, a Democrat-controlled House of Representatives. And uh, for the final two years, um, also the obvious uh, administration of a Democrat-controlled Senate as well. But because they do have that shared philosophy and the common rhetoric, um, they do provide political cover for each other. Um, so they, you know, so basically Thatcher can say, well, you know, I'm on the right side of the arc of history because, you know, Ronald Reagan's doing this. And he, he could say, well, Thatcher's doing this and we just, you know, should we go? I, can't be, I can't be completely wrong. Um, so in terms of um, this relationship between the two of them, I will just suggest that publicly a lot about Reagan's and Thatcherism are they in common? Are there any commonalities, similarities, connections? It's all about the messaging and the presentation. So it's about the politics, really. 
um, which is so important. I think it's because of that messaging, because of the politics of it, is why they are seen to be um, two peas in a pod, to be in cahoots, um, to be uh, both um, leading examples of um, the new right. So just um, while possible, we get into any Q&A, I just wanted to be remiss if I didn't mention things coming up um, for our network. Um, Dr. F. Annis um, is, we'll be talking um, in, in a couple of weeks time about Estonia and the Cold War, which will be fantastic. And also we have um, a spin-off event, if you will, where Lord Neil Kinnock, formerly the Labour Party um, from the 1980s, Thatcher's main opponent, of course, um, across the dispatch box in the House of Commons, um, will be zooming in um, to New York St. John. So um, basically spread the word, please you know, share your friends and colleagues and students and so on. Um, and if you obviously probably can't access those direct links, but um, just go to York St. John events um, to register for your Zoom link on did for today. So I'll I'll probably leave it there and I'll uh, I will look forward to continuing the discussion now. Yeah, thanks, Jim. That was that was really fascinating. Thanks for kicking off this lecture series as well. Um, with I think actually from my perspective as somebody who works on East Asia. Um, but as someone who's also studied um, Cold War Europe um, and spent a lot of time thinking about the Cold War in Europe and then moving on to the Cold War in East Asia. So it's actually quite a good way to start off a project on the 1980s, I think, because, you know, we've got Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, perhaps uh, alongside Gorbachev, the two, the three most famous people, perhaps, in the world in the 1980s, or at least when we think about the 1980s, probably, mostly. Um, but I'll, I mean, let's open up to questions. Um, and, and like I said, if you wanna speak, just raise your hand and I'll, and I'll try and unmute the microphone. Uh, and if you wanna type, there is the Q&A box um, there. So, um, so please do fire away. Um, and, and, Perhaps I'll, I'll just give people time to think. I'll, I'll maybe ask a question first, then seeing as I'm on and, and there's no questions in the box, if that's all right. Because I, 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 like I said, they're, they're really important in the 80s. Or at least it seems that way when we look back. So what, what I want to know really, and, you, and your discussion was really about what they, would, what they were like in the 80s, this relationship, and whether it was important or on what level it was important. And I just wonder, that from a wider historical perspective, what do you think? think their historical legacy is what is their their long-term historical effect you mentioned you know they were good at managing and presentation so do we have them to thank for for fake news and and donald trump and um brexit <laughs> yeah what's the link oh god well i think in terms of terms of together like in terms of anglo-american relations um often they are kind of seen as the, the iconic duo to replicate. So um, you might see, you know, Ray and Thatcher in the, in the golf buggy together. You know, um, I think um, Brown and George W. Bush did something similar and Brown looked incredibly uncomfortable at the time. Um, so there, there is that, of course. And they are seen as an example of, you know, Ray, Brit, Britain and America working very close together to all the shared common interests. But in some ways, I think the, the comparisons of the historical legacy is actually most interesting. Of course, Margaret Thatcher, she wins in 1979, 83 and 87. And you're not likely to find many people in Britain who are alive at the time who will admit to voting for her. So it's almost like there's a coup d'etat in the UK for 11 years, um, when actually about 40% of people did. Um, you know, more in some time, more blue collar union workers voted for Thatcher because of them never before. So, and then of course, Major goes on wins in 1992. So her legacy is 18 years of conservative rule. And then of course, ultimately, the uh, the Labour Party adapts, a bit like Bill Clinton in the United States, and move to the triangulate, move to the centre, uh, and ultimately they, they accept the economic arguments of the. They essentially they concede the economic debates of the 80s to the right. Um, basically, we're going to continue, you know, basic low taxes. We want to deregulate um, private, you know, emphasis on business, private economy, that kind of stuff. But for Thatcher, she's very much a I suppose a British term, a Marmite politician, very divisive figure over here still. Um, so, but whereas, and even the Conservative Party, we tried to run away from her in recent years as well. So David Cameron, when I remember he comes in in 2005 as leader of the Conservative Party, he says that um, there is such a thing as society, but it's not just, a, but it's not the same thing as the state, because Thatcher famously, famously said there's no such thing as society. 
So he wants to kind of move on from from, from uh, Thatcherism. Then, of course, there we have a, a Conservative Party leadership contest, and when we have a lot of them in recent years, and there's always somebody who's trying to like echo Thatcher, you know, be compared to Thatcher today. Um, so, but in some ways, the Thatcher's biggest legacy is probably two things. One is probably Tony Blair and you like that. Um, and the second thing you could argue is, is Europe, because the debates and divisions over Europe from the Thatcher years just go on and on and on. Um, so ironically, Thatcher's very big on the single market, being put in the single European Act, wants to create this. Um, but of course, but ironically, but she's, so she's keen on the economic project, but also keen on the, the political project kind of. Um, and also it's kind of what does her in, it kind of basically what leads to her downfall is because you start to get a bit nervous about some of the political aspects of European integration. Uh, and this one then just goes through like, these Tory wars on Europe into the 90s, into the 2000s, and ultimately you could say onto Brexit. And he could argue that there's some aspects that single market, such as the freedom of movement of people, which is what was used, um, which, is, which, which is the really kind of divisive um, policy issue when it comes to the European Union and perhaps led to, to Brexit as well. Reagan, on the other hand, Reagan's liked, you know, he's, he's, in terms of opinion polling, he's still seen as like one of the top two or three um, popular American presidents. Um, um, even when he was in power, it was like, well, people may not have necessarily agreed with Reagan, his policies, but they liked him. So I think for Reagan, it's um, he made Americans feel good about being Americans again. So, so the fact it's very divisive where he just didn't like her or the politics or the policies. For Reagan, it's like, well, yeah, I quite like him, but I'm not quite sure about the things around him. But again, for Ray, just how Thatcher's like the legs, what Thatcher did kind of fed into the 1990s and the Labour and so on to Brexit, you could say that Reagan's rhetoric is what the most long term impact he has in the United States, which leads to perhaps the contracts of America, the contract of America in the 1990s, the Republicans in the House, New Gingrich, um, and of course nowadays the contemporary and Republican Party. Um, so, you know, there's a big debate of would Reagan get the nomination today in the Republican Party? Well, Based on what he did, his policies in terms of he actually did increase taxes, he did do immigration reform, um, maybe not. But in terms of his rhetoric, you know, like some time, probably. Um, so there is that as well. Um, so, but also I think for Reagan as well is that the, well, whilst the Conservative Party tried to move on from Thatcher because she was so divisive, the Republicans couldn't move on from Reagan because politically they had no party elder. So the Democrats, they can like wheel out kind of Bill Clinton, and Barack Obama, and Hillary Clinton, Michelle Obama, and so on. Um, you know, so it's reasonably kind of popular figures in the United States. Whereas, of course, with the Republicans, George Bush Senior lost. He's a one term. He lost. Um, and of course, George W. Bush has like Iraq, um, very controversial. So the Republicans don't have that kind of party. So, so they was looking to the past because Reagan he won twice. I mean, how many of the Republicans have won twice? Um, George W. Bush won twice. Um, maybe he won second time, but obviously first controversial. Um, but Bush Sr. lost. Nixon had won twice, but he didn't last the whole time. Ford did a couple of years, and Eisenhower won twice. But then you get into like, you go, you know, so it's, they haven't really got that kind of popular party out. So Reagan was seen as kind of high point success. Because, uh, of course, you know, they can point to economic growth, the Cold War coming to an end, um, it's Reagan and the Republican Party. Um, so I think it's a different, the legacies are different um, in, terms, in terms of the context. So, oh, that's great. Um, yeah, does that, does, that, does, that, does that answer your question? That, then, that was brilliant. Um, very academic in, in, in yeah, covering such a wide range of stuff. So that's great. Cheers. Um, we've got a question from Derek. He said, nice, nice job, great start. Um He's curious about Northern Ireland and how did Reagan react to the one area where Thatcher was an Iron Lady in ways that seemed to quite a lot of people actually, yeah, quite appalling. How did Reagan react to Thatcher's Northern Ireland approaches given American semi-sympathy to republicanism, even if not specifically IRA republicanism? Uh, okay, that's a, that's a whole other paper. I'll, I'll talk to my best. Um, thank you, Derek. And uh, I'm looking forward to Derek, Derek's papers. because these terms will be great. Going to do another... I think a real interesting um, talk about the 1980s reconsidered and so on. And, uh, when it comes to Northern Ireland, Reagan didn't really get it. So uh, there was a great conversation where he's, they're at um, an event to celebrate Nancy Reagan's, I think, her stepfather. He's won an award or something. And, um, and the U UK ambassador's there. 
and they're all kind of chatting away over dinner. And this is a great example where actually you could argue that ambassadors now aren't like in the old set ambassadors, they're more really kind of like intelligence gatherers, like little kind of party spies, like I was chatting with so-and-so and they kind of feed to put about a bit of like extra details of um, the briefings back. And he was chatting, I think it, was, it might be Henderson, it was Henderson or Robbie, they were chatting to Reagan. And uh, Reagan said, I don't understand Northern Ireland, why can't the church just sort it out? She just doesn't get it. Um, and so when Thatcher does do the, the Anglo-Irish, she signed the Anglo-Irish Agreement in 85, I think it is. Uh, it's on the eve of Reagan's first meeting Gorbachev for the first time in, in Geneva. And uh, there is a big deal about made about this. So uh, Reagan goes on, you know, does a big speech to Bernie, so we're going to send American aid and so on, you know, financial support, we, you know, help regenerate Northern Ireland. Um, and he writes his diary, he thinks, oh, we've now brought peace to Northern Ireland. He thinks it's done. Um, but of course, it wasn't done. It was just the first step on that Anglo-Irish process. But in terms of um, Northern Ireland it's in, in the United States, the story really is in Congress. Um, I think that's the main story there. So Jimmy Carter is the first president, presidential candidate press to really talk about this. He famously walks down New York, New York, New York City with the, uh, the Get Things Shout of Ireland uh, lapel on there. And he also meets with the um, a group of, uh, I think it's, it's he meets with a group of um, Irish Americans who are very sympathetic to uh, Republicans on the eve of the presidential election. And this gets back to the British, and there's a massive meltdown at the front office. Like, are we going to have a US president who wants a United Ireland? It's going to be critical, critical of all this. And so the cards people basically calling the Brits saying, oh, don't panic, you know, he's not in favour of the IRA or anything like that. So, when you, but what you see in the, in the Carter years, is the, the four horsemen. So you get, um, it's Tip O'Neill, Ted Kennedy, um, Hugh Carey, of New York, and Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who's the US Senator from New York. And they're the four, they're very much influenced by John Hume. And they become arguing for a peaceful settlement in Northern Ireland. There needs to be peace and it's sorted out. And they convinced Jimmy Carter, being the Democrats, to um, make a speech that if, uh, to, if Northern Ireland, there can be peace achieved or work towards peace there, America will also have like an American international fund for Ireland that they'll send money to Northern Ireland. So Carter makes his promise, and it's Reagan, under Reagan's idiot that he's fulfilled. But ultimately, it's the, still the story still remains in Congress. So Thatcher's first meeting with Carter when she's um, prime, prime minister, the first two or three pages of the, meet, of, the met, of the minutes of the meeting, she's talking about Northern Ireland to Carter, saying, well, your Congress has banned the sale of, um, of, of arms to the Royal Oscar Constabulary. This is outrageous. We want the American guns because they're better. And he's saying, well, I can't think about it. It's yet to talk to Tip O'Neill. And Tip O'Neill has passed it because a chap called Mario Biaggi, who's an Italian American from New York, um, he's, a, he's a firebrand, he's much more of a Republican sympathizer. Um, and he's he's basically put, so he, he attaches to a, as an amendment to another, I think just a regular bill or um, a, a defense spending bill or something. And O'Neill has to accept because O'Neill can't, on the one hand, be saying, IRA, you've got to stop it. America stops sending money to the IRA. We need to have a peaceful settlement and then allowing American weapons to be used by the Royal Oscar Constabulary to go after the IRA. So O'Neill's a very difficult position there. And the story really just remained in Congress. So O'Neill puts pressure on Reagan um, to meet with Thatch talk about, talk about Northern Ireland. And in 84, I think it's in that, um, that meeting, which I showed you uh, an extract from the minutes from. Um, Tip O'Neill actually sends a note to Reagan saying, she please mention Northern Ireland to her because Thatcher at this point has been very intransigent. Um, you just have the New Ireland Forum, which puts forward various solutions or possibilities to how to resolve this question. And she famously says, um, he's out, out, out to all the options. And the Irish Americans, these four horsemen, they're furious about this. And so Reagan doesn't really get involved. He's not interested really, just well, you know, he, he wants to talk about other things with Thatcher. But what he does, he says to Margaret Thatcher in the meeting, Tip O'Neill sent this letter to me and he wants me to raise Northern Ireland with you. And then, then she says, OK, and she says, oh, yeah, me and Garrett Fitzgerald, we got great progress has been made. We they move on. Reagan then goes to Tip O'Neill and says, oh, yeah, I raised your concerns. Don't worry. Yeah. So Reagan's kind of actually playing both sides so, because he knows he needs to placate O'Neill because so he, he, what he, he wants from O'Neill ultimately is obviously... Um, he wants his, his, his own agenda to get through, but also is interested in the, you know, reversing the Boland amendments to send money to the Congress. Mm. So there's a whole game being played when it comes to, to that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, hopefully Derek, that kind of maybe goes somewhere to answer your question very long when you away.
Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, Derek's actually written there. Uh, Reagan didn't really get it. Could be a biography title. <laughs> yeah. Um, Epps put a question in um, about how how Reagan and Thatcher's relationship. How did it compare to other political relationships in the nineteen eighties? Well, I'm not entirely because I've obviously been a because maybe I, I don't speak other languages. So I'd love to look at, say, like, you know, so other, you know, other documents like, you know, what I can see from, say, um, last few weeks, I've been looking at the British documents of Thatcher's meetings with Mitterrand and Schmidt and Cole, especially around 81, 82. And what's interesting in these meetings is that they're all critical of Reagan. They don't like what he's doing. And Thatcher saying, yes, I agree. You know, this is terrible. We need to tell him to do something different. Um, so again, this could be that kind of playing both sides. Like she wants to be like the, the, the transatlantic bridge, if you will, that kind of the, uh, that British foreign policy with a bridge between Europe and America. Um, but so she's actually in agreement a lot of time with the West Germans and the French, for example, about American deficits and interest rates um, against American sanctions in '81 against the Soviet Union, um, against what he wants to do in terms of nuclear weapons at Reykjavik. So. Yeah, so I think, so really, she's, she's actually, they're talking about it. So, which is quite interesting where there's a lot of good work done by um, a friend and colleague of mine, Thomas Robb, about uh, the idea of coercion in Anglo-American relations, in the, especially in the 60s and the 70s. And I think it's almost like in the 80s, they start to push back a bit. Uh, they're not quite happy with what the Americans are doing. And in some ways, it could that could actually be, you know, if you interest people, interested PhD projects or whatever, it could be, this is like a, is it part of the story of European integration? But as they get closer and they get richer, they feel more able to say, no, we don't like this, actually. Um, so in terms of other, other leads, I think, I think Thatcher would have cultivated a relationship with whoever was American president. When she meets Gerald Ford in 1975, 76, um, she's all about how great Gerald Ford is. Um, when she meets Jimmy Carter, she's very, very keen to be you know, close to Jimmy Carter. Um, Carter's not been impressed with Thatcher. Um, there's a great document where um, I think uh, Brzezinski writes, she's no longer the, the hectoring, the dogmatic um, leader you met a couple of years before, before he meets her in St. Norman, she's prime minister. And he writes, I agree. So Carter's not, not a big fan of Thatcher. Um, but if she would have gone out of her way to be trying to be close to whoever was the American president, she was, she was an Atlanticist. Uh, and of course, it's in British interest to be close to the United States. So I don't know if that answers Epps' question at all, but... Uh, um, yeah, no, it's, it's it's a great question. Um, I, just thinking about Japan, I suppose um, Nakazone, who was the prime minister through most of the eight, is 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 generally seen as being part of this Reagan and Thatcher group, and in instilling this neoliberal uh, political and economic discourse in within Japan. Uh, and I th and I think there was always this idea that um, Japan was had had a special relationship with the US and 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 does really right up until um, you get into the 1990s and the economic um, um, crisis. So, um, I, yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, I guess that there's probably research on it. But, but again, at the uh, it's like the summits. Um, they all they all have the, the, in some ways the key meetings at summits are actually the little bilaterals they have, and they'll talk about each other. So there's a great moment where I think the, the Brits, the Americans, are talking about, oh, we need to kind of raise concerns about some about Japan in some trade or economic issue. And um, so uh, I think Edward Meesel, maybe, um, so Reagan's got Edward Meesel, well, maybe Thatcher could say something. And then Reagan would back up Thatcher. Isn't that, and then Jeffrey Howell, the Chancellor, she says, well, no, we can't because we've made commitments to Ger West Germany and France about this. So I believe like, maybe the Japanese could say something and then we can then do, you know, there's all this kind of like game playing go going on. Um, Actually, so, um, Stefano's put a question um, yeah. about is there research on this relationship through the lens of foreign markets or other regions? It would be interesting to see the relationship through the eyes of Argentina's propaganda machine or popular culture, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, if, any, if anyone's uh, up for it and, and they've got the language they haven't got, we can we can certainly do something. Yeah. Uh, and we've got we've got one more question um, from Harry. Uh, Kershaw, was Reagan angry with Thatcher after the ending of the Falklands War? Huh. I don't think it was angry. I mean, just wanted, he just wanted it to, like, you know, settle down. Um, it's when they meet after 
of the polka or that she's um she's kind of buoyant she starts making jokes about like oh because reagan mentions um it's reagan also one of the reagan team mentions all these these the, the landmines in the folklands so thatcher says oh maybe we could use sheep to identify seriously maybe we can use the sheep it's like this is like thatcher being you know her, her humor because she's like oh i just want to walk um i'm the new Churchill type type of thing but the, the, the americans are very keen that basically we need you know, don't embarrass argentina we need to sort this out now you know we need a solution to the falklands um so i think he's, he's angry with her i think he's quite ultimately he's quite sympathetic in terms of the, the blood and treasure like he writes in a diary and his, his correspondence with her so he understands that you know the cost to, to britain for this um but it's yeah the, the americans want this to go away because they do not want the the argentinian junta to fall um, this is their their main concern. They don't want to because the, the Reagan administration they're they're obsessed with the idea of there being another Cuba. They don't want another Cuba um, happening. So it's why they're going to Grenada and the Right, cool. And and we're pretty much on six o'clock. Um, really good timing. Um, so I guess I'll just say thanks for for kicking this off, Jim. Uh, thanks for organising. Um, this as well and um, as you mentioned on your slide we've got uh, it's the 20th of March the next seminar session isn't it yeah um, and so hopefully um, well all of you that have joined today will be able to join us then as well uh, and there'll be a lot more events being advertised and, and other things right yeah Brilliant. okay yeah thanks everyone for coming thank then. you all for coming thank you Martin you know, so I think no, we end no, this no. now don't we? it stops recording so uh yeah, so thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank you.